Uh, thank you for joining the CDTLP Level Up uh, webinar series. So just a bit about myself as a moderator, I'll be facilitating today's seminar. And I joined the CDTLP uh, in 2021. Uh, I started as a patient farming don donor man member, and now I am joining as the education training platform lead team as a co-lead. So I look forward to collaborating with you all, especially with our growing, growing trainee network over the next couple of years. And furthermore, in terms of my education, I am currently completing or doing my PhD at the University of Toronto. So the CDTLP is hosted by the University of Alberta, and we respectfully acknowledge that we are located on Treaty 6 territory and respect the histories, language, and culture of First Nations, Métis, Inuit, and all First People of Canada, whose presence continue to enrich our vibrant community. So I acknowledge, uh, encourage you to acknowledge your land in the chat box. So in terms of today's agenda, we welcome Dr. Shala Shafi, Shafili. Um, Sandals, Shafali. <laughs> Shafali, sorry about that. <laughs> Shafali, who will be presenting on leadership in transplantation. So before I introduce Dr. Sando, we have a few housekeeping notes. So today's webinar and discussion are being report, uh, recorded and will be posted on the CDTLP website as well as the YouTube channel. So we request that you turn on your cameras and mics off during the presentation. Once the presentation is complete, we will ask you to turn, turn on your cameras and if you have questions or comments to please uh, ask. Dr. Sando directly. Now it is my pleasure to uh, introduce Dr. Sando, who is a transplant nephrologist and associate professor at McGill University and an investigator at the Research Institute of the McGill University Health Center. She received her postgraduate training at Sunny Upstate Medical University and the Uni University of Ro uh, Rochester, followed by a transplant nephrology fellowship at the McGill University Health Center and a research fellowship at the John Hopkins Medical Center. Her clinical and research interests are to improve access to living kidney donor transplantation, as well as retransplant using the health system approaches. She has over 30 peer reviewed publications and has received a clinical faculty development research grant from the American Society of Transplantation, a kidney health research grant from the Kidney Foundation of Canada, and a research innovation grant from the Canada uh, Canadian Donation and Transplant Research Program to support this work. So I am pleased to turn this over to you, Dr. Sandel. Thank you. Um, hi, everyone, and thank you for again giving me the opportunity to present this talk that I've given a couple of times in some of the other countries. So this is for the first time that I'm doing it in Canada. Um, and it is by no ways that I'm an expert leader or a leader in the field. It's just my personal observation and, uh, uh, you know, my uh, like uh, reading on what it means to be a leader in transplantation and what it means uh, and how to achieve that. That is what I will be presenting today. I will start by a small disclosure that I've received an education grant from Amgen Canada. And these are the objectives of my talk. So I'll uh, start with something based, very, very basic. What is leadership? Traditionally, we think of leadership as one taking an official position of authority. So a CEO, a director, or something along those lines. And traditionally, this was based on these older theories of leadership, such as the great man or trait theory, which, which said that you know leaders are born or they have these traits that make them a great leader and that you can learn them. Um, also, there is something called behavioral re leadership theory that focuses on how leaders behave and assumes that these traits can be copied by other leaders. Uh, another one of the theories is called the contingency theory, which talks about effective, effective leaders who have different ways of working with their followers, depending on the situation and the needs and the attributes of those followers. And transactional leadership, which is perhaps still practiced in some parts of the world, where the leader motivates by reward or by punishment. Now, all these concepts, as you can imagine, are very outdated. This is not how many people envision leadership anymore. And when I say many people, I mean 
like actual leaders of our generation, such as Bill Gates. This is what he says. Leaders are those who empower others. Somebody who's done a little bit of um, research and uh, written a book on this subject talks about that leadership is a process of social influence where you maximize the efforts um, of others towards uh, the achievement of a goal. And this has nothing to do with seniority or one's position in the hierarchy of a company and nothing to do with titles. So what is leadership as actually changed? And this is from the corporate world, not even the healthcare industry. In the corporate world, people now think of leadership more from a transformational perspective. The transformational theory goes beyond the more traditional uh, aspects that I've just, uh, or traditional theories that I've just mentioned. And it emphasizes that like people, they, they more, work more effectively if they have a sense of a mission and it focuses more on supervision, organization and good performance. And transplantation is a unique field in medicine that, you know, where we apply ethical norms to social practice, there is greater accountability and transparency than what can be seen compared to other fields of medicine. Obviously, there's a scientific component to our field that is necessary for progress, for development, and for clinical practice. And inherently, our field is very collaborative and multidisciplinary. So transformational leadership is actually very, very effective and is, at, is key to the continued growth and success of our field as we face newer and newer challenges as we move along uh, with new, new ethical principles being introduced, new things, uh, practices such as you know transplantation being introduced. So that's what leadership is. And why should we think about being leaders like you know we are uh, a transplant nephrologist or a transplant coordinator or a patient partner why should we be leaders in our field the reason is that there's actual studies that have shown that when when it's like there's a study that showed that if physicians take a leadership role the quality of care that is delivered to patients improves and the way they showed that is that some of the best performing hospitals in the u.s were disproportionately led by physicians so it is always believed that people who are in the trenches who know how things work uh, are more likely to uh, uh, you know put forth this transformational leadership that is needed in today's day and age it also as somebody who are in the trenches of things we know the system we know the systemic issues plaguing our our uh, practice our patient uh, our you know delivery of care to our patients. So we are in the best position to improve these systems and ameliorate these systemic issues that are that exist. And also as, as leaders, we can advance knowledge, we can advance understanding, and we can advance wisdom in medicine. So that is why we should all consider taking some kind of a leadership role within our careers uh, over time. So with that, I'll move on to the next part of the talk, which is the longest one. What are the different paths that one can take when they're pursuing leadership and transplantation? When I was first asked to give this talk, I actually sat down and I thought about who are the best leaders in my field. And, you know, I, it, it, like I'm a qualitative researcher. So what we do is we, uh, you know, we, we thematically analyze the data. And so we, we code them, we subcode them, and then we develop these themes. And that's what I did. I thought of all the great leaders in transplantation I've met, and I, I sort of narrowed down what pathways they have chosen. And these are some of the pathways that came along, which I will talk about, including some emerging pathways that I think uh, where maybe there are some great leaders, or maybe they're in the process of becoming great leaders. So I'll start with the first one, which is very, you know, something that we're, is, that is something that is key to any scientific field, which is innovation. And most of the times, it, innovation is done via is, is clinical innovation, so which is introducing new diagnostic and therapeutic methods into clinical practice. Now, the key here is that it's not experimental care. You're not a scientist doing experiments. What you're trying to do is that you're taking something that's newly accepted and that whose experimental methods have shown that they are efficacious and they're safe, but there is a lack of experience or, or there is a lack of data to show the applicability of these particular in, of this particular in, innovation, or we need to precisely define the indication for this thing. That's what clinical innovation is. And this is quite a unique pathway to lead because I think this is where one really can attain a legendary status in the field. And I'll give a few examples of who I believe are great clinical innovators in our field. So I'll start with 
a Nobel Prize winner, Dr. Jo Joseph E. Murray, who performed the first successful kidney transplant in humans. And he, ma he mastered the fact that he discovered how rejection occurs and he mastered all organ transplantation. And he, uh, the first transplant he performed was obviously in bet uh, between homozygous twins. Another great example is Thomas uh, Starzal, who became, uh, who's referred to as the father of modern transplantation and performed the first human liver transplant. Again, not because it was not attempted before, but he was the one who performed the first successful one. Um, more clo uh, more uh, recently, Elmi Mueller, Dr. Elmi Mueller, she's a South African uh, surgeon who, re it, it, her profile was f uh, featured in Lancet and she's absolutely amazing and so inspiring. She pioneered HIV to HIV transplantations in South Africa much before it was done in the US. And even more closer to home, we have Dr. Chef Kashavji, uh, uh, Shafiq Kashavji actually, uh, who gained international recognition for the development of lung preservation solution. Not a completely novel concept because preservation solutions were developed in the field of kidney transplantation, but they had to be adapted and fine-tuned to the, the to the to uh, a different organ. And uh, also a key to highlight is that you don't necessarily have to be a clinician in the field of transplantation to be an innovator. You can have other expertise. So for example, Dr. Paul Tarasaki, who, um, you know, he was an immunologist and he's uh, he introduced microcytotoxicity assays for detecting anti-HLA antibodies. And he has helped this, uh, like, you know, helped us with HLA typing and for cross-matching. And he, he's been a great innovator uh, in our field. You can be a mathematician. Here I will highlight the profile of Dr. Somer Gentry and her husband, Dr. Segev, who I'll talk about in a minute. But Dr. Uh, Gentry is a mathematician and uh, Dr. Segev is a, is a transplant surgeon. And they together came up with the kidney pair donation program in the US because you know she's a mathematician. She knew how to create an algorithm. And now she focuses on operations research and its application to the optimization of organ transplantation. So she's not a clinician, but she's a she's done fantastic work for our field. So uh, clinical innovation is probably the first path that one can think of if they want to attain leadership in transplantation. Another like some something more common pathway that you will see is research. Uh, what is research? Scientific research entails applying systematic and constructed scientific methods to obtain, analyze, and interpret data. And scientific research can, you know, can be fundamental or basic. It can be applied, which includes clinical research. There are several methods one can um, base it on, such as quantitative methods, qualitative methods, and mixed research. In, within transplantation over the past decade, there's a lot of uh, national registry data analysis and big data analytics that have become quite popular, but qualitative research and mixed research is also a, you know, a field that many people such as myself are taking up because it helps answer the why once the quantitative data has uh, like, you know, analyzed a problem. So there are several other unexplored uh, research areas such as you know, ethnographic research, which can be done in our field, exploratory research, descriptive explanatory, longitudinal, you name it. But there are several, several, several different methodologies, seven, several different approaches that one can use if one pursues this pathway to leadership. The first profile I'll again highlight is Dr. Dori Segev, who is a transplant surgeon and a very, 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 uh, you know, pi like a pioneering um, person. And I know him personally, and I, I find him absolutely fascinating. Uh, this is his H index for all, uh, for uh, uh, people who don't know this number right here. I would dream to have an H index of 100 in my lifetime because it indicates how impactful the the scientific but like you can publish but that published work has to generate uh you know an impactful finding that other people cite and that other people adapt and use it to clean uh, practice and policy and h index uh, index is sort of a surrogate ma marker for that and dr segev has done amazing work on kidney exchanges desensitization donor risk access to transplantation post transplant outcomes Closer to home, somebody with an even higher age index is Dr. Garg, whose research focuses on living donors, and he's really has helped, you know, then amazing work. There's an amazing paper he's published in New England Journal of Medicine, where he talks about uh, the long-term risks uh, to women who donate a kidney in terms of pregnancy, and it's a very well-cited, very uh, well-appreciated paper that came out of this group, but he it really has helped uh, set up the clinical practice guidelines that define how we, uh, you know, define risks to living donors and even understand the risks to living donors. So, 
uh, and again, you don't need to be a clinic clinician to be a, um, a researcher. I highlight the profiles of two uh, epidemiologists who I very much like, who I've had the honor of knowing. On the left side of the screen is Dr. Mira McAdams, whose research focuses on frailty, aging, and cognitive uh, dysfunction in patients who are on dialysis and if kidney trans and, and also the ones that receive kidney transplantation, how we can improve it and uh, you know how we can identify it. And on the right side is um, uh, Dr. Tanjula Purnell, who study, uh, whose research focuses on improving equity in access to kidney transplantation, not clinicians, epidemiologists who just have done fantastic work in the field. The third arch um, to leadership and transplantation can be via education. And this is very interesting to our field because first is training education. We, we as, uh, as you know, clinicians, for, uh, nurses, social workers, we are all involved uh, or we should all be involved in the, the education of trainees and you know, our future health, work, uh, health force. So teaching future health professionals critical to maintaining the future workforce and teaching, I think, is an essential part of clinical practice as far as uh, like I'm concerned. Like I, I love, I, I think they keep me on my toes and they, uh, like my trainees, increase my knowledge. So one can be involved in uh, in training education. And in this, uh, in this uh, particular uh, uh, slide, I have highlighted like different roles that one can take within the graduate medical education and the undergraduate medical ed education. And a profile to highlight here is that of Dr. Azim Gangji from uh, McMaster, who is very, very involved with the Royal College and getting, um, uh, you know, uh, the, the solid organ transplant accreditation, etc., done. And uh, many other uh, lectures, uh, he's, he's involved in many other training symposiums with the CST. But what's really unique to our field is that we can be leaders in patient and public education because our field depends on donation, uh, the disease donation as well as living donation. So education on organ donation, exp explaining this, the social significance of organ donation is key to increase our increasing our disease donor pool and enhancing the educational process uh, is key to increasing the living donor comprehension, optimizing the informed consent process, and ultimately increasing transplantation. And Dr. Amy Waterman perfectly exemplifies this field, who is a social psychologist, and developed a fascinating and uh, continues to develop fascinating educational programs for patient and potential donors. Uh, there's one that is being implemented or has been implemented in Ontario. It's called Explore uh, Ontario. And uh, again, she's a psychologist, not a clinician. Uh, the next arc to uh, which can lead uh, one can pursue to uh, leadership is administration. Now, administration is one where we take on a task of developing administrative policies to organize a program or to develop the overall mission and mandates in in a very like you know in, within our healthcare uh, environment. So, and as I mentioned, that research has suggested that that is associated with delivering good care to our patients. As a healthcare professionals, we are content experts and we know the core of our business. And that's why we can make effective administration, uh, administrators who can run a transplant program well. So this, I will highlight a few profiles here. So on the left side of the screen is, um, is someone who uh, was a, a Dr. Dossiter who was actually uh, he was actually at McGill and he's a Canadian physician and bioethicist and he coordinated the first kidney transplant in Canada and the Commonwealth. A few years after it was done um, uh, by in the world, but at least the first in the Commonwealth. And, uh, you know, he was a great administrator. I had the honor of meeting him and he gave me my, my plaque once I graduated, but a great person uh, and a great administrator. And then um, um, uh, like some, the people I continue to work with, Dr. Paquette and Dr. Landsberg, who, like you know who like are very involved with CBS and I, I believe CDTRP as well but they've done so much for our field when it comes to living donation and standardizing the processes across the country implementing paired kidney exchange etc living donor evaluations that I think they're great administrators another one again you do not need to be a clinician is Tim Solette who is an American pathologist who is the co-founder of the BAMF classification and as you all know uh, may know that BAMF is what we use when we are um, uh, you know reading our kidney biopsies or our uh, transplant biopsies of other sources organs. So administration also a great field uh, to proceed. And then you can 
and take other administrative roles, such as you can be the president of um, uh, you know, National Society. So Dr. John Gill, who was a former AST president, and handed over the uh, the baton to uh, Dr. Dipali Kumar, who's now the president of the American Society of Transplantation, of uh, Dr. Marcel Kantarovich, who's the president of the the Transplantation Society. So uh, they they are helping define where these societies, uh, you know, what what agendas these societies support. And at the end of the day, they are advancing our field and our great leaders in transplantation. The next field uh, or the next path to leadership is advocacy, and this is where I think is like, and I might choke a little bit when I talk about this. So advocacy is that you contribute one, your expertise or you influence the field to improve the health and to support our patients. And this is where I think patients and patient partners can be the, the, the leaders in the field. That this is this is where I think we we need, I, I don't think many, many clinicians, many healthcare workers do a good job at this. I, I think this is where we need patients and patient voices. And, and this is just a great example of, how this can be done. So uh, I, I'm sure many of you know about the Green Shirt Day, which, um, uh, so there was a Humboldt Broncos tragedy that many of you may know about where uh, defenseman Logan Boulay, he passed away after an accident and his parents decided that, uh, well, he uh, Logan was a registered donor, so they donated his organs. But what they did very well was they promoted uh, donation. They promoted people to uh, register as organ donors, and they still continue to do so. And it is estimated that over 150,000 people registered to became uh, to become organ donors uh, uh, in the days and the weeks that followed um, uh, the death of this very uh, this this young person. And to date, this is believed to be the largest number of Canadians um, that have registered to be be organ donors has been because of this one particular event. So it's it, this is, I think, the field where patients and patient voices can really matter and they can take on this this role, at, role as leadership and role to leadership in transplantation. So, but obviously transplant professionals are also uniquely positioned to function as public advocates. Why? Because we understand the field, we understand the medical aspects of these issues and we have access to policymakers. And the profile I want to highlight here is of Dr. Robert Montgomery, who was a who is a transplant physician, and he has always been an advocate of doing high risk transplantations. He's always he's he's in the news a lot because of xenotransplantation, transplantation, and he always is somebody who who talks about like let's proceed with the next thing. Like this is this is considered high risk, but let's go ahead. This is what we're going to do to mitigate the risk. And why I call him an advocate rather than a researcher is because he himself is a transplant recipient. He received a heart transplant from somebody who had hepatitis C, a donor who had hepatitis C, and he talks about his own journey to getting a transplant. And so he, he talks about how he always talked about at like you know risk and uh, you you know like um, how we should be at telling patients to accept these high risk organs and now he himself took that and then he he wrote a perspective piece in the England Journal of Medicine of how we should be getting comfortable with risk and I think he did he's done a lot for uh, our patients and as an advocate um, as a patient himself. Um, all right. Uh, ethics. Now, ethics is another one, very, very interesting field in our field and a uh, very interesting path in our field. And as you know that, I, I don't think I need to explain what ethics means, but it's really just uh, systematizing, defending and advocating the concepts of right and wrong. And within our field, there are all, always new emerging ethical issues. And we, we are pushing the envelope when it comes to, uh, you know, accepting different kinds of um, donations, such as now we're thinking about doing advanced donations. So there are always going to be new and new is issues that emerge that will need ethical frameworks and transplant professionals will have to be at the, at the front of leading those efforts. So such as when we talk about financial incentives versus financial neutrality, implicit versus explicit uh, uh, consent versus presumed consent. And then there's always things like commercialization of organs where uh, transplant uh, leaders have really taken up a, a, a huge role in, and they have uh, set up the declaration of the Istanbul group that talks about, uh, you know, th that has uh, set the standards of um, commercial, like what we should be doing to, to mitigate like commercialization and, and abuse of people all around the world. But anyways, ethics is a, is a great field uh, to explore as well um, as a leader and, and within this framework as well, I don't think it it necessarily applies to transplant professionals. I think patients, patient partners, everybody uh, can 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 choose this field to pursue. Some of the more emerging fields are uh, things like social media. So um, the social media, uh, you know, I recently wrote a 
in uh, like this perspective piece where we we talked with many trans and professional that it's a very underutilized field uh, underutilized thing in our field we, we can do so much more for organ donation but it's just that as professionals we're not trained we're scared we're not thick skinned we cannot uh, you know uh, we're not used to trolls we're not used to criticism so it's very hard to uh, be uh, to engage in social media but you know, we live in the age of social media, so uh, saying not engaging is not the answer, but how to do it effectively is something that we need to explore. And many, um, many people are taking a leadership role in this. So this is uh, Dr. Frank Dore. He's from Europe, and he was actually the the um, social media uh, ambassador of one of our uh, journals. And now he's the social media ambassador of the European Society of Transplantation. And he does quite a bit uh, promoting transplantation and transplantation related research online. Um, and another few emerging fields are things like quality improvement, AI, IT, like all, all these fields are emerging and many people are taking this path to leadership and obviously patient partnership. And I, I'd be remiss if I don't mention Marie Chantal Fortin because she is a leader in this field and who she, uh, her and uh, I see a couple of patient partners uh, on this uh, webinar, but patient partnership is absolutely an emerging pathway to leadership in transplantation. So. Uh, obviously, I'm not going to talk much about it. I, I will have people who are on this webinar comment towards at the end on how they, they th what they think about this. So with that, I will go to the third part of my talk. So how do I choose from these pathways? So what I want to first mention is that these pathways that I sort of in interpreted based on what people have done in the field, they're only meant to serve as a guide on where to start, but they, they are independent because many of the best clinical innovators of their time were the top researchers as well as administrators of their time. So while you might decide that I want to pick one pathway, you'll see the opportunities present where you will be asked to be a leader in something else uh, because you have built the expertise or you have the experience. So most of the times you'll, you'll see that you'll be pursuing two, perhaps three arches. And also leadership development is non-linear and it, it can involve multiple domains. So it doesn't necessarily mean you have to choose one pathway. How you choose also depends upon your personal interests and what you're good at. So if you are a, a, an introvert and you know perhaps advocacy might not be the best pathway to choose. So it, it depends on who you are as a person and what your interests are as well that one should look at, like what should I be pursuing? And this requires one to really delve into your strengths and weaknesses and requires like a personal reflection of who you are. And the third very important thing is demand and supply. If you try to pursue something that like, you know, when I was starting out, there were so many clinical epidemiologists within my division that I didn't want to be another clinical epidemiologist in my division. I wanted to pursue different. So it's also important to look at you know, what is there a need for within my field? Because you, you want to be the expert, you want to be the leader in that field. So uh, within your the, your work environments and within your um, uh, provinces, it's important to reflect on what is there a need for and what can I, how can I help as well? But also what there is a need for, what is there a demand for and what there is a surplus supply of. So, uh, so those are the kinds of things I would say that how one can choose. And the last part of the talk is, what should I do to make sure I'm successful? And, you know, I, I have some people uh, like say, oh, I'm doing it out of passion. I don't care about success. But I, I think most of us are driven a little bit by the fact that we want to be good at what we do and want to be successful and be recognized for what we do. So for that, I looked up this, um, uh, you know, one paper and it, it was very interesting what they said. They, they said, like, there are three keys. To being successful as a leader so and though and within that there are like a couple of other things they mentioned but the the, th the three keys are the opportunities that come to you and that you create the mentors and the skills and the preparation so for example if you want to pursue a basic science career obviously you have to you know find the skill set that prepares you to be a basic scientist and um you know run a lab independently so it's if you want to pursue uh, uh, an epidemiology career uh, it's important to you know, get at least a master's in epidemiology, if not a PhD. If you wanna be a social media ambassador, perhaps taking a couple of training courses on how best to engage uh, people on social media might be necessary. So training programs, workshops, and building the experience is, is necessary to be a good leader and to be successful as a leader. But then also is great mentors. Now, having a good mentor is a, is a talk on its own. Like, what, what is a good mentor? But, you, you know, it's, it's, it's a friend, it's a guide, it's like somebody senior in your program, but uh, there are many, many facets of mentorship 
that one can think of, but it, it really is somebody who can guide you and who's very honest and gives you constructive criticism. It's not somebody who just praises you. In fact, people always say that the best mentors are those that when you give them a paper uh, and they just make two comments, those are not great mentors. Like when you give them a paper and that paper, that paper, uh, paper to review and that paper is full of comments, that's a good mentor because they spent time looking at where you could improve because we're all at the end of the day learning and improving every day. And the other one is opportunities. Now, I don't know if you can go to uh, like a place that doesn't have uh, a heart transplant program and then you, unless you want to start a heart transplant program, but that's a different story. But if you want to pursue research in heart transplantation, it'll be very tough to do it where there's no heart transplant program in the in the city. So opportunities, obviously are created, but they also have to be there within the program for you to pursue a path to leadership. So it's it's important to organize, understand what opportunities exist within your own, um, within the programs that you're at or within the provinces or the societies or the organizations that you're at. Um, and, and then there's always funding um, to support those opportunities. And some personal ones I always like want to say that, uh, that I think are very important and Again, this is based on a little bit on experience and a little bit on um, what I've read is that you have to have a supportive environment. You have to have uh, people who will support you. Like if you have an assay running that cannot wait and then you're on call and you get two consults, you have to be in an environment where somebody will be like, go work on your assay, I'll see the two patients, you know? So, and that kind of supportive environment, like it's, it's uh, you, you have to have colleagues who can be there for you at the end of the day. So it's it's very important to work at a place where you can, the people you work at with, I, I feel sometimes I spend more time with than my own family. So having a supportive environment is very, very, very important uh, to be successful, to be a leader, et cetera. Continuing to develop your skills is very important. Uh, you know, I, people I talk to 30 who are, who've been practicing for transplant, uh, like transplantation for 30 years, they always say how much the field changes. And it's going to be the case even for me. Like when I retire, I, I think like my field will have completely transformed. So uh, if like there's nothing inevitable then change. So as things change, one has to develop their skills, one has to learn new things, and one has to adapt to those new things. As I mentioned at the beginning of the talk, the definition of leadership has changed. Like now we, we no longer believe in these old theories of leadership and it's more transformational. So uh, one has to adapt to that and develop their skills, maybe take training courses, uh, there are so many webinars, so many modules that are offered um, on leadership, but uh, similarly on like, let's say I want I wanted to learn about qualitative methods, I just uh, I joined a course to learn about qualitative methods. So uh, there are opportunities to develop your skills, even after you've trained initially and continue to do that. Take constructive criticism and make changes accordingly. This is a challenging one because a lot of times we hate being criticized. As humans, we hate being criticized, but taking that criticism and working on yourself is sometimes important, not all the time, but you know, sometimes like maybe the criticism is not great, but uh, uh, a part of our, our train, like when we train our trainees, we, we want them to get better. So we, the criticism that we give them is really an opportunity for them to become successful and to improve and to be better in the field that they're pursuing. And an important one, avoid negativity and pessimism. That goes without saying, like, you know, I, I sometimes our world has become so divided and so negative that I, I don't know where we're headed, but uh, like to be, one has to be excited and optimistic about what they're doing and work hard. That goes without saying. All right, so I just will conclude with my example. So when I uh, um, graduated um, uh, Transplant Fellowship, I picked research. I, I, I sort of kind of knew which path I wanted to take. So I picked research and advocacy. Uh, and how did I pick it? I sort of, sort of led into it. I was in an environment where they, there was no health services researcher and um, there was opportunity. there are opportunities for research within transplantation uh, within my field. Like I, I work on system system level issues when it comes to living donor kidney transplantation and nobody was doing that research in Canada. So I decided to take on for it. So I, I sort of was led into it. I looked at that there was a demand for it and very few people were pursuing it in Canada. So I, I picked this field. And how did I ensure that I, um, like, you know, I developed myself was that I pursued the right training. So I trained under Dori Segev for, at Hopkins, and I worked at the right institution. I picked a very, very, very supportive institution at, at McGill University. I had, um, I trained here for one year in transplant nephrology, but I knew that the people I was with, I could work with. Like, they will have my back, they will mentor me, they will inspire me. And then I had the right mentors. So first is Andrew Sibulski, who's not a transplant nephrologist, but he was my division chief then. And he really, like, you know, he, he's somebody, he's a basic scientist, but I sent him a research on health services, 
my, my grant on health services research and he'll review it and he'll, he'll send it back with, with, with comments. And, uh, you know, a mentor doesn't have to be a specialist in your field. They, they just have to be somebody who can give you, who can show you the right direction and can be your friend and, uh, you know, your agony aunt at some time. So Andre was that to me and he's still that to me. And then Obviously, my other mentor is Marcelo Kantarovich, who um, is my colleague now and was the program director of transplant nephrology when I was uh, when I first came at McGill. And uh, I mean, he he has created so many opportunities for me, and he's um, you know he's mentored me in more ways than one. But neither one of them were method ex methodology experts in the field that I was pursuing, which was health systems research, and that inv involves a lot of qualitative methodology. I learned quantitative methods with with Doris Segev, but I still needed somebody uh, who could help me with qualitative methods. So I had a third mentor, Marishanta Fortin. So, uh, you know, it, that's why I put the S Rex to it. Like you don't necessarily have one mentor. You can have multiple mentors that help you within diff at different stages of your career and continue to help you throughout the course of your uh, training. And again, like these organizations that have been very, very supportive. One of the first um, grants I was awarded was with the CDTRP in 2019. And uh, I know this says 2022, but the first grant was 2019. And then following that, I got a grant from the CBS, from Kidney Foundation, and the uh, I got a salary support from FRQS. So all these opportunities helped me. Uh, you know, I don't think I'm a leader, a, a huge leader yet, but I, I hope it has set the path for me to be a leader. And now that I sometimes reflect back and look at the arch that I, you know, pursued, like I started out with research and advocacy, but I sort of got into administration because I became like I was elected selected to be the chair of the Young Members Committee of the Transplantation Society and the Emerging Leaders Program of the International Society of Nephrology. So I, I think I'm going to be ended, I'm going to take on more administrative roles and education. Now I have a great postdoctoral fellow who's uh, who's I'm help uh, who I'm mentoring and helping and I have another undergraduate student um, and uh, as always, like I, I like I, I think we're at the end of the day, all practitioners are advocates. But I, I hope I continue to pursue the advocacy arch as well. So, so that was what I had all I had uh, to say on this subject. And I'd love to hear your thoughts and answer your questions. So, thank you again to the CDTRP for inviting me to present on the subject. Hi, Dr. Sano. Thank you for that great presentation. It has certainly given us a lot to think about. So if anyone has questions or comments, please turn on your camera and ask them. Um, as we wait for people to get prepared for questions, I do have a few to start leading. Um, I, nice presentation on the changes in leadership. Uh, through my studies, I've come to recognize the importance of how leadership is coinciding with mentorship and how that has impacted my experience in learning. So you have touched a, bit, a lot on the changing um, definitions of this field. How do you think, what are the steps that current supervisors or people in positions of power can take so that they learn the skills or they start developing the skills to be mentors in the newer sense? And how can trainees recognize um, mentors that are compatible with them? A great question. So uh, as a mentor, I do think that I needed, I did think uh, a few years ago that I needed some training on how being a good educator and a good teacher. So I did pursue that training as well. And McGill offers uh, uh, training um, uh, webinars and courses and seminars uh, for those who want to pursue this career. But if you really want to pursue a career in education, I would, again, say like more formal training is necessary because if you want to be an educative, uh, like effective educator, I think it's important to take training as a person who wants to be an educator. When it comes to the other way around, I, I think when you um, network, you will see who you gel with. I know my personality and I am, you know, I, you can say I'm a hyper person, I'm an active person, and I knew that I need to find people who are hyper and active like me, uh, who I can gel with, who I can work with, and who will inspire me and who will, you know, lead me into the field, but I'm an extrovert. Now, I, I, like, so I, so Dory is exactly like me, Marcelo is exactly like me, and these are my mentors, and Marie Chantal Fortin is sort of like me, uh, she's the same height as me, but she's sort of like me. Uh, but Andre is not like me. He's a he's an introverted person. But it's just that he was in the position of leadership in my program, and I just seeked him out. And then 
when you get the positive response, when you get like, you know what, uh, Andre, I, can you do this for me? Because you have so much expertise in obtaining grants and reviewing grants. Can you review my grant and give me a feedback? And that receptivity is another great indicator that this person will serve as a great mentor to you. So I would say both like how you gel with the person that you are seeking mentorship from, as well as the, the continuous feedback that you get and how receptive they are, both are key to finding the right mentors. Thank you. Uh, now let's open up the floor. Uh, I'm not sure who is uh, open the camera first. Um, okay, you go. I can uh, I can quickly jump in and, and certainly encourage others, especially our trainees and of course our patient partners to, to ask. Uh, I'm to I'm happy. A couple of questions. Oh, oh sure. Yeah, go for it, Murray. Yeah, go for it. Okay. So listen, I'm a seven and a half year liver transplant, and I've worked on projects around the world for many years in big organizations. And what I've learned about our big organizations is that the panacea that you describe requires a lot of uh, factors to line up. Like, first of all, are you living in a supportive environment or are you living in an environment where there's a, a couple of fiefdoms that get in the way of doing really good, honest work? Um, it, that's just a question I'd like you to consider in uh, refining your thesis as you go ahead. The other one uh, that I caught right at the first um, end was you saying that this leadership style, which I do believe in, <clears throat> uh, doesn't uh, use uh, carrot and a stick, money and punishment. Um, and then you referenced uh, that the US uh, had many, many, many more successes in running their hospitals, which are private institutions with the doctors in charge. And I would argue, you might wanna consider what the economics of that is for those high-end doctors in comparison to what we have in our provincial systems here. Do you have a paper that you could uh, allow me to uh, uh, read on that so I could understand the stats and take a, 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 a more than an anecdotal uh, view that I've just taken. But anyway, I want to congratulate you on a very thought-provoking uh, session and th the Guinness record for the most words and most ideas in a 35-minute presentation ever. Thank you very much. So I absolutely agree with you about the environment. It is like, you know, you have to have supportive people who within your like, like that was one of the other things I mentioned is that we, we have to be in a supportive environment. We have to be in a, in a place where uh, the, the people will, like that you work with will understand that you have professional as well as personal obligations, which is something I didn't talk about within this the scope of this presentation. We all have personal obligations. And if somebody cannot support you in those trying times, this is not a great environment that you will prosper in professionally. So supportive environment, I absolutely agree with. With respect to the evidence, it's not great. The, the, evident, the, the, the phrase that I quoted that the best hospitals in the US were run um, by uh, physicians came out. Uh, so there's an annual report from the US that comes out of the top hospitals in, in, in the United and these States. Guys make, these guys make five times as much as our star doctors do. Right? Uh, absolutely, absolutely. They, okay. like the whole so fund economics do have an impact. Absolutely. The, the economics in the U.S. hospital that like the way I put it is that in, in the U.S. Um, it, you get money when a patient comes to your hospital in Canada, you, in a way, in a way you lose money because we are funded by the government and each patient admission comes out of that budget. So, I mean, we don't think like that, but th that's the, the economics, as, as you mentioned, is much different. But there is an efficiency that uh, is needed to, you know, uh, improve care and to improve the flow of money. People people think it's always about the money. It's actually not. It's efficiently putting the money at the right places. That kind of efficiency can only be implemented by somebody who knows the field and who practices. It cannot be done by administrators. So th that's what I think most, there's no good empirical research to show that because you kind of need a randomized trial where you have two hospitals and you assign different CEOs and you see how they're run. But they, they it is generally thought that the hospitals that implement good care, good care are usually run by 
uh, physicians or people who have exper experience in clinical practice, like maybe nurse practitioners, et cetera. Um, well, anyway, I've taken up too much of your time, but I want to con congratulate you again on your presentation. Thank you. Thank it's you. Um, confirmed many of my anecdotal uh, feelings about how these systems work. Um, and I would like to have a research paper that talks about what you've been talking about, okay? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Understood. Thanks. Thank you. I, Thank Manuel you. knows how to get a hold of me. <laughs> Thank you. This is true. Yes, yes, Murray, you, you know how to get a hold of me. Uh, I, I guess uh, Dr. Sandal, a great, great presentation, even myself, you know, kind of as, as you spoke, mm -hmm. a lot of things really resonated with me. Um, even how I have, I've ended up in my role here as CCRP Spatial Family Donor uh, Partnerships Manager. I, I want to specifically ask, so you had a slide on advocacy, and then you mentioned that patient partners, like that's really a role where patient partners can can engage and, and doctors, physicians perhaps don't do it as as well. Now, of course, I agree. Like, I think our, our patient partners have a strong role in that advocacy piece. Um, but I guess the, the question, or I'd really like to know your thoughts on, like, why is it, why is there that gap in advocacy? So, like, my my perspective is, it really should be like it should be a tangent, right? Like, physicians should be leading it side by side with with patients. But it seems, at least from what I've seen, that that's not always the case. <laughs> but my perspective is. You know, we can tell the stories. I can go tell the story, my story, my transplant story, but that's not going to get me a, a meeting with with the minister, for example, or whatever the policymaker is that we're trying to change, uh, make change. So, like, how, how do we improve that? How do we? So I guess, the reason I think patients, the yeah. reason I think patient makes better uh, patient and family members make better advocates than physicians most of the time, not all the time, most mm -hmm. of the time, is because they have something we call the lived experience that we don't have. We, we, we really like, you know, I, I like nobody can effectively demonstrate the story of a patient on dialysis than the patient on dialysis themselves. So I, I think that's where the lag is. And also, um, generally speaking, most of us were nerds in school. So we don't know how to make impactful uh, presentations. Many of us don't. And we don't know how to get the message across. We don't know sometimes how to simplify things. I, I think in grant applications, one of the uh, cha most challenging things that uh, we have to write is the lay summary, because we're so used to using ESRD, ESKD, that to, to do it in a lay language, we don't don't know how to do that. So, but I still like your point about being side by side uh, with the with the ministers and with the policymakers because they're like I think patients make better advocates than physicians. But at the same time, physicians have a role in being in the same room by the patient's side to be that advocate because they bring a perspective mm -hmm. too. They understand the system, the health system, perhaps a little bit better than the patient. They may not communicate the lived experience as well, but they have that experience with the system. So uh, everything mm -hmm. is a team effort, but I, I think some health professions could possibly make good advocates. And I'm trying to develop that skill. Again, it's, 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 an, it's something that it is an acquired skill you learn you know learn how to influence the the room and influence and convince the room that you're in that what you are presenting is is the most important thing on the planet and it requires skills so i'm trying to acquire that skill but i i think a more impactful uh like one of the most impactful presentations i've been to is when logan boulay's dad spoke at the cst or when sylvie charbonneau spoke about her experience as a living donor like those those presentations like somehow stay in my mind all the time because they kind of narrate their lived experience with something that i can say it but i didn't live it so that's why i think uh, but i agree with you there has to be a side by side for both of us to do it and i think we get cdtrp kind of does that so Thanks, Dr. Sandal. I, I saw a couple um, folks uh, uh, turn on their cameras if you had any questions or comments. Austin, I think. Yeah. Hi. Hi, can, hi, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, uh, great presentation, by the way. Thank uh, you. It's, you know, I've heard uh, many presentations about uh, how to be successful and what you're saying, like it's, uh, it, it sounds like a real good idea. Like I, I took a picture of your bubble chart and uh, that says a lot, you know, it was all summed up there. And the idea is great, but the uh, to try to, as a patient partner, you know, with the lived experience to uh, break into a system that doesn't follow your model uh, is not easy. You know, but uh, you know the, the the status quo, and this is just my experience. 
my lived experience as a patient and also my lived experience in the uh, place where I live, the community where I live. So I, I expect that every patient would, uh, would have a different experience in the health situation as well as their support situation in the community that they're in. So if everybody followed this model, it would be a pretty good uh, situation, but unfortunately, you know, but uh, I believe that with, with people like Manuel and uh, CDTRP, uh, the patients are, are, are finally getting a voice. But not only that, but I, I think, it, you know, attending presentation like this, it, it uh, fits into one of your bubbles there, you know, like for training and workshop and, and guiding us in how to fit into your model. But, you know, we have to be given the opportunity. I mean, I'm 67 years old. I'm not going to start a new career. But, uh, you know, I think I could help uh, uh, being in the age that I am, I think I could help with the other generations uh, experience what I experience. Because you're never going to experience what I experience say, as a 12 year old boy living on the, the, the coast of Newfoundland where you had just freedom. You know, you get up in the morning and you go to school and you come home when you're hungry and then you go and then you come home when it's dark. And if you didn't come home when it was dark, you know, but that, that's just the way we lived and everybody lives a different way of life. And, you know, but anyway, I, lo I love your model and I love your So Austin, I absolutely agree with you. I'll, I'll give you an example. So at the Hopkins, they have this program, it's called the Live Donor Champion Program to train, uh, you know, recipients and potential donors and their social networks on living donor kidney transplantation and how to be champions for the particular recipient. Yep. They had six sessions and their most popular session was their fifth session, which was very well attended. And that was the session, not where they got to be doctors or nurses or anything like that, that's where they got to meet previous donors and previous recipients of living donors. Patients yeah. actually want to talk to previous living yeah. donors. And exactly. where I, yeah. that, that, where I run into know, I, I know myself and I've attended many, many uh, webinars and seminars and uh, discussions with different people. And I think I've even recognized some people here that are, that are on this call. I recognize their names anyway. And if I see their faces, I probably would. But uh, the, the thing uh, is, uh, you know, I wake up every morning and I think about, you know, who my donor is, but I don't know because I have a deceased donor. Like th that's something that I have to uh, live with for the rest of my life. And, uh, but anyway, you know, that's just one of the things that, uh, and we Hopefully also, we can we can we can address that at you know some other webinar. But right, but like what I was gonna also stuff. ask that is how can patient be pursued? Like I I like I, I didn't realize how to have so many patients and patient partners, but I can I can tell you like I go through this a lot on the other side of the table with my brother who has to constantly access the health systems, and when I notice how much difficulty he faces being the like a, an educated person accessing health and how I have become his voice and I have become the navigator. I really yeah. think an improvement in delivery of care, there are so many other pathways. Um, yeah. And the one that I didn't mention that is sort of being very well explored in the field of oncology is patient navigators, where you like there, there are these like, you know, when you have a cancer diagnosis, it's, it's like you, you can't keep like things straight, like for, for you no know, need to explain that. And then there's a specific role of patient navigator who help the patients, you know, it, it, like in layman, like I can tell them, oh, you get this chemo, yeah, you get this the, video. It's the, like yeah, patient I, remember I, that. Like, yeah, I, 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 I get that. But, you know, we always have had patient navigators, but they were never given a title, right? And they were yeah. the nurses that took care of us, mm -hmm. right? But they were advocates. But the system that was in place hindered their advocacy. That's it. That's and I it. can give you many examples that pop into my mind right now, but I don't think maybe I, maybe I should give you one example. Uh, and when I was on dialysis at one time, and uh, 
Uh, I don't like lights. I'm, I'm like that myself. I like, for some reason in the daytime, I'm fine, but in the nighttime, I just want everything to be dark. So when I was taking dialysis, they, uh, there was all bright lights above. Uh, anyway, I asked the, uh, the nurse to turn off the lights. There was one light switch and every light went off. But that was against red light regulations. You cannot mm. have the lights off. Oh my God. In a oh dialysis clinic. So, but that's just one of the things. But well, there, was, there, was, there were advocates there, but that one, the lights had to stay on. The, the person who turned off the lights was told you ca you cannot. Mm -hmm. But for for that's the way the system was working at that time. But you've anyway, given me a lot to think I've about. Talked, I've talked enough. Sorry. Well, you've given me a lot to think about, and I'm going to explore this uh, somehow in within a research question. Thank you, Austin, for that uh, feedback. Thank you. May I make two quick questions to or comments to uh, Austin? Uh, first of all, I'm going to disabuse you about your age. There are many more of us that are much older than you <laughs> who are uh, involved full time in this effort to make things better. Secondly, with regards to waiting for the system to welcome you, I, I think you have to make them welcome you. They aren't they aren't inclined in these big, big organizations to say, I want to hear what you have to say. You have to go and pound on the table, like the Boulets do, right? Sorry, I took up so much time. Uh, S Sylvie, you have your hand up. I, we have a few sure, minutes yeah. left, so if you, if you want okay. to make your question or comment, uh, go for yeah, it. Yeah, sure. I'll try to be quick. Um, thank you for a great presentation, Dr. Sandel. It was very... Uh, inspiring I, that's Thanks. the word i comes to my mind um i want to continue on manuel's comment about advocacy with patients and and uh the medical staff doctors being side by uh, side by side with patients um i understand when you talk about leadership that um you know in your environment you have people all around you in that field when we're a patient when we want to try to make the system improved or make bring changes to the system you know i'm in my basement i have all the, these ideas um yeah, yes i can knock to a few doors but um i'm not in that field so if i want to assume leadership in some areas of transplantation or donation what would you recommend what would be the first step for a patient who has an idea um you know, I'll throw something on the table. I think that 30% of families reject uh, not honoring the decision of a deceased donor is too high of a number. I want to work on that. Where do I start from? How do I show leadership in that? So um, the, the two ways I think we can approach this issue is by, by, con, um, by the path of, uh, by contacting the organization. So the environments who support this question. And I, I can personally tell you, I know of physicians who are very actively involved in research in advocacy related to disease donation. There's Matt Weiss at the yeah. University of Montreal who would love to work, I'm sure would love to work with a patient partner on a question like this. And then within the organizations that you're affiliated with, I think that's where your uh, your voices can be heard and you can take the charge of um, how it can be heard. Getting support for these kinds of uh, projects require funding. And that funding to, you know, to support th this research question, like CDTRP has done an absolutely fantastic job, but they also have an innovation grant. And they, 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 they give us, if our, if our methods are sound, they give us money along with a patient partner, a researcher who has the training in doing this kind of a researcher, research and a patient partner, they, they can provide the support to do this kind of a research. It's hard to do this kind of work outside of a setting where you don't have access uh, to a ethics board. Because if you want to pursue any, and that's where like I have um, trouble even with like what to Austin's point that a lot of times I'm looking for patients because my patient wants to speak with somebody, but everything has to be done with the, there's a consent process involved. Like there's an ethical approval that has that is involved. So all of that that we do, there are all these like 
you know these i call them bureaucratic like things but obviously they're in place for a reason like there's a re there, there's a whole history of how, how patients were abused and that's why we have the ethics board so without an ethics board this cannot be pursued within a research uh, field but there's an emerging field which i think this question is perfect for which is quality improvement and quality improvement projects are not done with the with this in a research setting in mind they are done really to improve the the pro, uh, improve the processes that are in place and this is a fantastic question for a quality like a cqi we call it continuous quality improvement a cqi project and if 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 you want i can get you in touch with the people who would love to work in things like that matt wise i know does a lot of research on this and would would uh, i'm sure love to work with this within a research setting or within a CQI setting as to why 30% of uh, families refuse donation. And what a great question. What a great question to pursue. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sano. In the uh, essence of time, I think we're going to wrap things up. Thank you Thank very you much. For, <laughs> thank you for these uh, nice, nice topic. Um, yeah, it has been both been quite thought provoking, and it opens up a lot of venues for further discussion. Um, even in my personal life, in terms of training and everyone else, so we, uh, Murray Austin. Um, just to to thank you once again on on the presentation, and also as a reminder, next week uh, we will also have another webinar by uh, Dr. Kafak Tenakor, and uh, everyone, please uh, sign up for it. The topic is on why does frailty matter for patients waiting for kidney transplants? And thank you once again for joining the session. Thank you. Thank Bye. you. It was very nice to see some familiar faces and I, I hope to, um, and you've, you've given me something to think about as well. Thank you, everyone. Thanks you. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, Dr. Sandal. Thanks, everyone. Thanks. Bye -bye.